not far from the eastern shore of the Hudson River, at that broad expansion of the river denominated by the ancient Dutch navigators as the Tappan Zee, there lies a small market town known by the name of Tarrytown. Not far from this village, perhaps only about two miles, there is a little valley, which is one of the quietest places in the whole world. A small brook glides through it, and the occasional tapping of a woodpecker is almost the only sound that ever breaks in upon the tranquility. This sequestered glen has long been known by the name of Sleepy Hollow. Drowsy, dreamy atmosphere seems to hang over the land as if it were under the sway of some witching power that holds a spell over the minds of the good people. <laughs> they are given to all kinds of marvelous beliefs, are subject to trances and visions, and frequently see strange sights and hear music and voices in the air. The whole neighborhood abounds with local tales, haunted spots, twilight superstitions, but the dominant spirit that haunts this region is the apparition of a figure on horseback without a head. It's said to be the ghost of a Hessian trooper whose head was carried away by a cannonball during the Revolutionary War and who was ever and anon seen by the country folk hurrying along in the gloom of night as if on the wings of the wind. The ghost rides forth nightly to the scene of battle in search of his head, and he travels with great speed to get back to the churchyard before daybreak. Such is the general belief of this legendary superstition that the specter is known at all the country firesides by the name of the Headless Horseman of Sleepy Hollow. In this out-of-the-way place in a remote period of American history, there lived a worthy fellow by the name of Ichabod Crane, who instructed the children of the vicinity. The name Crane was well suited to him. He was tall and exceedingly lanky, with narrow shoulders, long arms and legs and hands that dangled a mile out of his sleeves, and feet that might have been used for shovels. He had huge ears, large green glassy eyes, and a long snipe nose. To see him striding along on a windy day with his clothes fluttering about him, one might have mistaken him for a vision of famine descending upon the earth, or, or scarecrow escaped from a cornfield. From his schoolhouse could usually be heard the voices of his pupils reciting their lessons, interrupted now and then by the voice of the master or the sound of his birch switch as he urged some unfortunate along the path of knowledge. According to custom, Ichabod Crane was boarded and lodged at the houses of the farmers whose children he instructed. With these he lived a week at a time, thus making the rounds of the neighborhood with all his worldly effects tied up in a cotton handkerchief. His appearance at a home was apt to occasion a stir for the ladies thought his taste and accomplishment vastly superior to those of the rough country farmers. He had read several books quite through and was a perfect master of Cotton Mather's history of New England witchcraft, in which he most fervently believed and potently believed. It was often his delight after school was dismissed to stretch himself upon a field of clover bordering the little brook by the schoolhouse. And there study old Mather's direful tales until the gathering dusk of the evening made the printed page a mere mist before his eyes. Then, as he wended his way home by swamp and stream and awful woodland, every sound of nature at that witching hour fluttered his overexcited imagination. The moan of the whippoorwill, the cry of the tree toad, or the dreary hooting of the screech owl, or the sudden rustle in the thick of the birds frightened from their roosts. In addition to his other vocation, Ichabod Crane was the singing master of the neighborhood. Among his musical disciples was Katrina Van Tassel, the only child of a substantial Dutch farmer. She was a blooming lass of 18, ripe and rosy-cheeked as one of her father's peaches. 
she soon found favor in Ichabod's eyes, mm -hmm. not merely for her beauty, but for her vast inheritance. Old Van Tassel was a thriving farmer and a doting father. Every window and crevice of his vast barn was full to bursting with the treasures of the farm. Sleek porkers grunted in their pens, and regiments of turkeys went gobbling through the farmyard. The lanky teacher's mouth watered as he pictured every pig roasted with an apple in his mouth, and every turkey daintily trussed up with a necklace of savory sausages. As he rolled his eyes over the fat meadowlands and the orchards burdened with ruddy fruit, his heart yearned after the damsel who was to inherit them, and he determined to gain her affections. He was to encounter, however, a host of fearful adversaries. Katrina's numerous rustic admirers her. The most formidable of these was burly Brom Van Brunt, a local hero of some renown. His Herculean frame had earned him the nickname of Brom Bones. Brom Bones was famous for his horsemanship and always ready for either a fight or a frolic, though he had more mischief than ill will in him. With all his roughness, there was a strong dash of good humor at bottom. Whenever a madcap prank occurred in the neighborhood, people whispered that Brom Bones must be at the bottom of it. When Brom began wooing Katrina, most other suitors gave up the chase, not wanting to cross the lion in his affections. But Ichabod Crane persevered in his quest. He was therefore delighted when one fine autumnal morning a farmhand came to the school door with an invitation for Ichabod to attend a merrymaking at the Van Tassel farm. The young scholars returned loose an hour before the usual time, yelping in joy. And the gallant Ichabod then brushed up his only suit of rusty black, fussed over his appearance in front of a broken mirror. That he might make his appearance in the true style of a cavalier, he borrowed a horse from the farmer with whom he was then domiciled, and thus gallantly mounted, issued forth like a knight errant in quest of adventures. The animal he bestrode was a broken down plow horse that had outlived almost everything but his viciousness. He was gaunt and shaggy. His rusty mane and tail were tangled and knotted with burrs. He was blind in one eye, but the other had the gleam of a genuine devil in it. Still, he must have had a fiery nature in his day, for he bore the name of Gunpowder. Ichabod was a suitable figure for such a steed. He rode with short stirrups, which brought his knees nearly up to the pummel of the saddle. His elbows stuck out like a grasshopper's. And as he rode, the motion of his arms was not unlike the flapping of a pair of wings. The manor house of Van Tassel was thronged with the flowering beauties of the adjacent country. However, it was not the charms of the buxom lasses that caught our hero's gaze as he entered the parlor. <laughs> Those of the Dutch country table piled high with autumn food. There was the doughty doughnut, the crisp cruller, and a whole family of cakes. And then there were apple and peach and pumpkin pies, besides ham and smoked beef, dishes of preserved plums, peaches, pears, and quinces, not to mention roasted chickens and bowls of milk and cream. As Ichabod sampled every dainty, he chuckled to think that he might one day be lord of all this splendor. Ichabod danced proudly with the lady of his heart, his loosely hung frame clattering about the room, while Brom Bones sat brooding by himself in the corner. When the revels began to break up, Ichabod lingered behind to have a little talk with the heiress Katrina, fully convinced that he was now on the high road to success. Something, however, must have gone wrong in the interview, for he soon sallied forth from the mansion with an air quite desolate. He went straight to the stable, and with several hearty kicks roused his steed most uncourteously from the comfortable quarters in which he was soundly sleeping, dreaming of mountains of corn and oats and whole valleys of clover. It was the very witching time of night when Ichabod traveled homeward, heavy-hearted and crestfallen. The hour was as dismal as himself. Far below him, the Tappan Zee spread its dusky and indistinct waste of waters, 
with here and there the tall mast of a sloop riding quietly at anchor. In the dead hush of midnight, he could even hear the barking of the watchdog from the opposite shore of the Hudson. But it was like a dreaming sound in his ear. No signs of life occurred near him, but occasionally the melancholy chirp of a cricket or the guttural twang of a bullfrog from a neighboring marsh. All the ghost stories that he had heard over the years now came crowding upon his recollection. The night grew darker and darker. The stars seemed to sink deeper in the sky and driving clouds occasionally hid them from sight. He had never felt so lonely and dismal. Ichabod began to whistle. He thought his whistle was answered. It was but a blast sweeping sharply through the dry branches of an old tree. Suddenly he heard a groan. His teeth chattered and his knees smote against the saddle. But it was but the rubbing of one huge bough upon another as they were swayed about by the breeze. He passed the tree in safety, but new perils lay before him. About 200 yards from the tree, a small brook crossed the road and ran into a marshy and thickly wooded glen. Rough logs, open sides, and a broken roof served for a covered bridge over this stream. And where the brook entered the wood, a group of oaks and chestnuts, matted thick with wild grapevines, threw a cavernous gloom over it. As he approached the stream, his heart began to thump. He summoned up, however, all his resolution, gave his horse a kick, and attempted to dash briskly over the bridge. Instead of starting forward, the perverse old animal ran broadside into a fence. Ichabod, whose fears increased with the delay, jerked the reins on the other side, but it was all in vain. His steed started only to plunge into a thicket of brambles on the opposite side of the road. The schoolmaster now bestowed his heels upon the ribs of old Gunpowder, who dashed forward, snuffling and snorting. But he came to a stop before the bridge with a suddenness that had nearly thrown his rider sprawling over his head. Just at that moment, a flashy tramp by the side of the bridge caught the sensitive ear of Ichabod. In the shadow of the grove on the margin of the brook, he beheld something huge, misshapen, black and towering. It stirred not, but seemed gathered up in the gloom like some gigantic monster ready to spring upon the traveler. The hair rose upon his head with terror. What was to be done? To turn and fly was now too late, and besides, what chance was there of escaping ghost or goblin that could ride upon the wind? Summoning a show of courage, he, he demanded in stammering accent, Who are you? He received no reply. He, he repeated his demand in a still more agitated voice. Who are you? Still, there was no answer. Once more, he nudged the sides of gunpowder and shutting his eyes, broke forth with a psalm tune. Just then, the shadowy object put itself in motion and with a scramble and a bound, stood at once in the middle of the road. Though the night was dark and dismal, yet the form of the unknown figure could now be determined. He appeared to be a horseman of large dimensions and mounted on a black horse of powerful frame. He kept a roof on one side of the road, jogging along on the blind side of old gunpowder. Ichabod quickened his steed in hopes of leaving the mysterious horseman behind. The stranger, however, quickened to an equal pace. Ichabod pulled up and fell into a walk, thinking to lag behind. The other did the same. His heart began to sink within him. He endeavored to resume his song to him, but his parched tongue clove to the roof of his mouth and he could not utter a stave. There was something in the moody and dogged silence of his pertinacious companion that was mysterious and appalling. It was soon fearfully accounted for. On mounting a rising ground which brought the figure of his fellow traveler in relief against the sky, gigantic in height and muffled in a cloak, Ichabod was horror-struck on perceiving that he was headless and that he carried his head before him on the saddle. His terror rose to desperation. He rained a shower of kicks upon gunpowder, hoping to give his companion the slip. 
but the specter followed close behind. Away then they dashed, through thick and thin, stones flying and sparks flashing at every bound. Ichabod's flimsy garments fluttered in the air as he stretched his long, lanky body away over the horse's head in the eagerness of his flight. They had now reached the road which turns off to Sleepy Hollow. Just as he got halfway through the hollow, the girths of the saddle gave way and he felt it slipping under him. He seized it by the pummel and endeavored to hold it firm, but in vain. <laughs> He had just time to save himself by clasping old gunpowder round the neck when the saddle fell to the earth, and he heard it trampled underfoot by his pursuer. An opening in the trees now cheered him with the hope that the church bridge was at hand, the place where, legend said, the horsemen should stop. If I can but reach that bridge, thought Ichabod, I am safe. Just then, he heard the black steed panting and blowing close behind him. He even fancied that he felt the hot breath. Another convulsive kick in the ribs, and old gunpowder sprang upon the bridge. He thundered over the resounding planks. He gained the opposite side. And now, Ichabod cast a look behind to see if his pursuer should vanish in a flash of fire and brimstone. Instead... He saw the goblin rising up in his stirrups in the very act of hurling his head at him. Ichabod tried to dodge the horrible missile, but too late. It encountered his cranium with a tremendous crash. He tumbled into the dust and gunpowder, the black steed and the goblin rider passed by. next morning, the old horse was found without his saddle, quietly cropping grass at his master's gate. Ichabod did not make his appearance at breakfast. Dinner hour came, but no Ichabod. The students were assembled at the schoolhouse, but no schoolmaster arrived. In one part of the road leading to the church was found the saddle trampled in the dirt. The tracks of horses' hooves deeply dented in the road were traced to the bridge. There, on the bank, was found the hat of the unfortunate Ichabod, and close beside it, a shattered pumpkin. There was much gossip and speculation about the disappearance of Ichabod Crane. Some said he had been carried off by the headless horseman. Others reported that he had simply left town in humiliation at having been dismissed by Katrina. Shortly after his rival's disappearance, Brom Bones conducted Katrina in triumph to the altar. Whenever the story of Ichabod was related, Bones looked exceedingly knowing and always burst into hearty laughter at the mention of the pumpkin. The old country wives, however, maintain to this very day that Ichabod was spirited away. And it is a favorite story often told about the neighborhood round the winter evening fire the bridge became more than ever an object of superstitious awe. The schoolhouse being deserted soon fell to decay and was reported to be haunted by the ghost of the unfortunate schoolmaster. And it is said that one may still hear his voice at a distance, chanting a melancholy song tune among the tranquil solitudes of Sleepy Hollow.